So hello and welcome to my presentation on how fair is bioarchaeological data, for a particular emphasis on making archaeological science data more reusable. I'm a PhD student at the University of York, but I'm doing a collaborative doctoral partnership, which means that as well as studying, I'm also working for the Archaeology Data Service and Historic England. So what am I actually going to be presenting about today? Well, I'm talking about my master's thesis, and this will entail my rationale and why I carried out the study, and also have a hefty chunk on my results and sharing with you guys what I've actually learned from the study. But of course, it's going to have an emphasis on reusable, because to me, that's really important. And then we're going to continue and talk about how I think we can best manage the data in the future and how we can tackle the problems I'll present to you today. So what is the research all about? Well, it's all about bioarchaeology, and this can be interpreted in two different ways. It could be biomolecular, for example, ancient DNA, organic residue analysis, paleoproteomics, and stable isotopes. But also I'm combining in fields of more, less biomolecular, with fields of archaeobotany, osteoarchaeology, paleopathology, and zooarchaeology. These fields are generating vast amounts of data, and this data was so valuable to be able to understand our human pasts, understanding things about migration or diets. And ultimately, I'm investigating the need to make this data more fair. And I'm going to also present some potential strategies for how we can make it more reusable in the future. So why does it actually matter? Well, bioarchaeology is generating ever more data, and this is partly because it's becoming cheaper. And also, archaeology is very destructive, and especially if you consider fields of ancient DNA and stable isotopes, where you destroy the core sample to get the data set within. And as a result, the data becomes the primary evidence. But at the same time, you also need to consider ethical considerations, especially as many of the samples will come from human ancestors and human bones and remains. So as a result, I rely a lot on Landy et al, who said, you need to make data as open as possible and as closed as necessary. So how did I actually carry out the study? Well, I carried out a needs analysis. And to begin with, I looked at the EVA's D5.3 data curation policy, deriving from saving European archaeology from the digital dark age. This is written by Holly Wright and Julian Richards in 2020. And from this, I generated a questionnaire, a quant quantix quantitative questionnaire. Qualtrics quantitative questionnaire. Three cues, very hard to say. Uh, but ultimately, this was sent out to many different self-identified bioarchaeological specialists, particularly those who are identified through university web pages. I started out primarily focusing on the UK. However, people were very kind and disseminated out further. So as a result, I got a lot of results from Europe and also USA, but less from other parts in the world. So I'm sure that most of us have come across the fair data principles in the past, but for me, it's about making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And there are many different ways in which this can be achieved. But today, I'm going to be talking about persistent identifiers, open access repositories, metadata models, file formats, systematic documentation, and also usage license. So in terms of how many people actually can carry out the survey, 102 people did it to 100%, and 53 of these were people who I sent an email directly to. Due to the further dissemination very kindly from Sarah Ritz-Kanza and Marlon Holst, they sent it out using their disk email servers, and more people continued and carried out the survey, which is great. But also, interestingly, if you want to carry out research in the future, direct emails get a lot more responses than indirect. So that's my recommendation. In terms of where people are actually based, quite a lot of the people are based in the UK. And importantly for here today, I had two from the University of Edinburgh and one from the University of the Highlands and Islands. So if you're here, thank you. Uh, I also had quite a few from Europe, as I say, and some from America, but I didn't get that many from other places. I had one from Australia, Canada, and China, but also I had other responses which I wasn't really expecting. For example, I had people coming from the land of commercial, which it means that some people weren't really understanding the questions I was asking. So it does pose a question in the reliability of the results I'll present to you today. In terms of the individual specialisms, 
As you can tell, osteoarchaeology was the most picked field, whilst the field of archaeobotany was a little chosen. But also, people aren't the specialists in just one field alone. And this can be really shown clearly in this graph here, where paleopathology and osteoarchaeology are very common to be a uh, specialist in both of them. So as a result, when looking at the results later, it's important to consider that maybe some of them are doing different data practices for individual fields, but it's hard to necessarily derive exactly how they are doing that. But importantly, there's a lot of uh, reuse already happening, and this is across many different fields. And so the bottom x-axis here is in decreasing amount of interaction with, so stable isotopes is the most interacted with, whilst other and paleoproteomics are less interacted with. So I'm here to talk to you about the fair data principles and how it relates to bioarchaeology. So let's actually dive into the results. In terms of findability, it's clear that quite a lot of people are using precision identifiers, and especially if you look at archaeobotany or paleoproteomics, which means that the data can be findable and using it persistent identifier is great because it will always relate to the individual resource. In terms of accessibility, you can see where people have been publishing data most. And once again, using the x-axis, you can see that most people are using in published report, sharing it in a published report, which isn't so good when you consider how you can reuse the data. It's better to be putting it in a repository. And the only field where I'd really say it's doing great is paleoproteomics, so it's in a specialized repository, which is probably ISOARC. So there are specialist databases which exist, but maybe we need to encourage people to deposit more of their data in them. In terms of whether the actual war data is available, you can see that the majority of the data was said fully processed, which is not really good, because if the more unprocessed it is, the lower, the little, the less it is processed, the easier it is to reuse the data. And so if it is raw, you can actually access and reuse it in a lot more different ways. However, seeing as more of the data is being said fully processed, it's not going to be open to as many ways of reusability as possible. So we need to make sure that the raw data is accessible in the future. In terms of accessibility, is the data actually open access? Well, it seems to suggest that quite a lot of people are making their data open access. And I'll have to stipulate here, open access is definitely not a part of the fair data principles. They encourage it, but they are different things. However, by encouraging data to be open access, it really can help the fair data principles. And as you can see, ADNA, archaeobotany, paleoproteomics, and also other, all of their data is made open access, which is brilliant. But when people are asked about whether their data could be open access when they say that their data currently isn't. It was shown that quite a lot of the data can be made more open access in the future. And there were some instances where people said it couldn't be, and the reasons why are for legal reasons and ethical reasons. So into interoperability. In terms of metadata schema, I asked people whether they thought that there was an appropriate metadata schema, and unsurprisingly, most of them said, I am not sure. So as a result, maybe we need a bit more training, a bit more better communication with them to say, we need to make sure that the metadata schema is appropriate and that you guys are using it. However, really good news is that when they knew that one existed, most people said that it was appropriate, which is really good news. So maybe we just need to educate and share out the knowledge a bit more. In terms of file formats, the most used file format is PDF. And I think I've been listening to Tim Evans a little bit too much. I don't really like PDFs. We can use a hell of a lot of different fields. So if we can use maybe more XLSX, which is Excel, or other file formats which are a bit more open, we can reuse the data a lot better in the future. There are also intriguingly some data sets which are only used in individual fields, which is clearly shown by BAM in Ancient DNA. And this is because uh, there will always be some specialized file format. So as much as we want to try and make sure that everyone can access the data, we need to understand that some fields will need particular data sets that others won't use otherwise. In terms of reusability, uh, most people say it was really essential to reuse data sets in the future, which is really promising. They understand that reusing data sets is important. So maybe in the future, we can communicate with them 
and ways in which this can be achieved. However, some people did say it was unnecessary, which means that maybe, maybe some people don't understand the necessary on why it's important to reuse data. And I'm not entirely sure why they did say it was unnecessary. So I'm gonna contact those people and try and open a more direct conversation to say, why, why do you not want to reuse data? And surely it's a good thing to do? Uh, and there is extensive reuse already happening. So you can see here is that uh, most people are analyzing publicly available data sets, which is really great. So the data must be reusable to a certain extent. However, when people were asked whether they knew their data had been reused, most people did say yes, but there's quite a few of people who say they don't know. So if I knew my data was being reused, I'd be very happy. I like data being said. And so it's intriguing that quite a few people did not know. And maybe we should make it a lot clearer on when data was being reused. In terms of systematic documentation, this entails writing what each file contains and also the file version it is. Quite a lot of people do not systematically document, particularly prevalent in archaeobotany and organic residue analysis, which means that people may not know which file is best to use. However, quite a few people did say that their data is systematically documented, which is good news. And then people can know exactly which file and what has happened to the data beforehand. In terms of copyright, most people don't use copyright. And when they do use copyright, it is CC BY, the most open to reuse as possible. However, it's intriguing that quite a few people don't use copyrights. And it's, I'm not sure why that is the case. Maybe they don't need to copyright it, or maybe they don't know whether it is being copyrighted. So I'm not sure why people aren't copywriting their data when they can. And to be honest, if we're making it open access, then it's all good anyway. So into data management plans. Data management plans, as I'm sure most of you know, can be long, but they're important to do. If you say what you're going to do with your data, it makes it a lot better to manage it in the future. But quite a lot of people aren't creating data management plans, especially archaeobotany and organic residue analysis and the field of other. So we need to make sure that people are using them when they can, because they can really help make sure data is reusable in the future. So, this is the results of all the things I've been talking about today, ranked by uh, the most met element. I've got that arrow the wrong way around, I'm so sorry. <laughs> most met element there, and the most fair element uh, specimenism down here. So as you can see, archaeobotany. Yeah, sorry, my results are slightly wrong on that slide, I'm so sorry. But the most important thing is I can see that uh, paleoproteomics and ancient DNA are very effective in making their data more reusable and accessible in the future. And then based upon which element is most fair, at the top, you've got the initials for which element of the fair data principle. So reusable, people are reusing data, which is brilliant. And quite a lot of data is open access in terms of accessibility, but also interoperability might need to be improved on in the future because these are towards the bottom of where things are being met. So I've been presenting to you a lot of results. So why does it actually matter? Why am I here today talking to you about it all? Well, there is a finite amount of material. And as a result, due to the destructive nature of ancient DNA and paleoproteomics, we need to make sure that this data is made accessible and reusable in the future. Due to its destruction, the primary evidence becomes the written and the data becomes the primary evidence. And so as a result, if you make the data generated from it more accessible, it means that we can reuse data sets as much as possible. Yet currently, as I was showing you, they're definitely not in a state that is reusable. And so we need to make sure that more is done in the future. And we need to make sure that it is done as soon as possible. So how do I actually propose we can do it? Well, I've got several different stands, but we definitely need to focus on reusability. Uh, my possible techniques are we should try and encourage people to create data management plans, and these should be as standardized as possible. Yet, as I said, some files and file formats may be specialized for individual fields. So you need to make sure that it is as standardized as possible, yet as uh, different as it needs to be to contain the diversity of the field. 
in terms of the I also think we need to create communities. This is particularly in training and data communities. If people are working together towards creating better data strategies, we can make sure that they're being adopted and that there's more encouragement for the use of making data as findable and accessible as possible. Also, we need to try and encourage persistent identification use. In my idea, it would be great if we could use a DOI type system for each individual sample, link, linking it to each report, and maybe even each uh, individual it came from. Of course, that's going to be a nightmare to create, but the idea of being able to identify which sample is related to which report means they can really be using the amount of data in a lot better way. Also, I believe that we need to make better research tools. I really love research tools, so if we're able to federate the amount of different data sets into one resource, maybe if we look across all the different databases, getting all of the individual reports into one place, imagine the huge potential that would have not just for bioarchaeology, but archaeology in general. But also we can use the wonderful field of natural language processing and named entity recognition to unlock the masses of data which are stored in PDF format. It's something that I've looked at in the past, and it really does make data a lot more accessible and interoperable in the future. But also, I'm here today because I really want us guys to collaborate a lot better with bioarchaeologists. You guys are really good at your digital archaeology. Those guys are really good at their bioarchaeology. Let's work together and make it a better future for all of us. So, what have I actually been talking about today? Well, I gave you a rationale that there's a limited amount of resources and that there's more and more research being done. As a result, we're getting huge amounts of data sets, which might be lost in the future. We need to make sure that more is done to make sure this wonderful resource is reusable for future generations. But at the same time, we definitely need to consider the ethical implications of this. We need to make sure that data is being as reused and as open as possible, yet as closed as necessary. In terms of the results, I gave you a lot of results. Results are always handy. Uh, and it's clear that there is no standardization at all. So we need to make sure that people try and make data sets as interoperable and shared between fields as possible. You know, as I showed you at the beginning, all the fields are interacting with each other. So maybe if we made it a bit more standardized, it would be easier to reuse the data sets in the future. And as a result, they need more help. And that's why I'm talking to you guys. If we can help them, everyone will be happier. In terms of reusability, data is currently limited in their reusability. So if we work together on making things a lot better, better systems and better strategies, and maybe even data management plans, data sets will become a lot more reusable. But also I talked about the ways in which I consider the future could go. I'm always happy to have conversations and hey, my ideas will be someone else's ideas of yesterday. So if you guys are further along, I would love to talk to you guys and work out how we can best tackle the problems I've presented to you today. And also we guys need to create more training. You guys are very good at your data. Let's go and talk to the bioarchaeologists. So thank you very much for listening to me today. And if you have any questions, I believe that they'll be given after all the presentations, but I've got a QR code up there if anybody wants to use it.